Hello and welcome to another video from the only channel that you need to not only survive current apocalypse but actually enjoy it. And today's video is going to be the next video in our tent living video series. As you know, I've been trying to record a lot of stuff that goes on between me and my tent and what tent living is like for a while now, about a year. And I've actually decided to move the tent a couple of weeks ago because I found a really, really nice place that was much, much more scenic than the place where I'm at right now. But in the process of clearing that area, I've learned a few things about my hair. So you're going to see some upcoming changes, I do believe. Uh, in fact, there's already some changes. If you look, uh, last video I did, my beard was down to here. Now I've only got one dreadlock that's still hanging there. Because in the process of cleaning my woods out, I've lost quite a few dreadlocks. Uh, walking through areas that are very, very dense, uh, they just get hung up on stickers. Even if you're only moving two miles an hour, that's a lot of momentum. And beard hair is very, very weak compared to head hair, even though people do lose dread hair dreadlocks as well. And the reason for that is that your hair only grows so long before it falls out. And that includes your beard hair. And beards are much thinner than head hair for most people, at least for me. And so what happens is when your hair falls out, it actually doesn't fall out because it's still tied to the hairs that don't fall out. But as time goes on, you have more and more hair, more and more length, more and more volume hanging from less and less hairs that are connected to your body. And uh, here's, here's the results of getting your beard stuck in stickers while you're walking. Or another good way to lose a, a dreadlock I've found is to take a log and throw it into a fire not knowing that it has hooked onto your beard. The very first time I experienced anything like this was throwing a cast net and I got my beard caught in my cast net. But it was much shorter then and it didn't break off. It almost pulled me in the water or pulled my head off of my body or something like that. So anyways, uh, and that's not the end of it. In the breakage process, I uh, did an examination and found that this dreadlock was even though it it already broke off, it ain't finished breaking off because I don't know if you can see that. It should be pretty clear. I've got a big old chunk of hair hanging onto my head by a few little scraggly hairs. So here's the plan. Just in case you see me, no, I'm not trying to start a new style or anything. I'm probably going to come down here and cut this off and try to untie it. And if that doesn't work, I'll go up a little further and cut it off and try to untie it until I get all of these broken or breaking dreadlocks out of my beard. Now the hair is doing the same thing and I guess that's because it does take maintenance. I think you're supposed to maybe every week take your dreadlocks and just jerk them until they break apart from one another because they get tied into each other. Well what happened is my dreadlocks didn't get that process because I'm lazy. They grew very long and it actually turned into basically one dreadlock which is very uncomfortable so I took scissors and separated the, the hairs I ended up with this. It's the same thing. Very, very thick dreadlock hanging by a very tiny little piece of hair. And it may hang on for another two or three years, but it may break off tomorrow if I get it caught in the woods. With hair, you know, your head hair, you can pull it back and put it in a bunch of rubber bands. And when you get caught on stickers, your stickers ain't going to pull all your hair out of your head because they're you know, that's what's going to have to happen if you got them tied together. Now, uh, this particular video is going to have much more drama, uh, sensationalism, and excitement than previous videos. Not just because of the beard, but because of what has gone on out in my woods. And I'm going to take you out there and show you right now uh, the results of a storm we just had. I had to go to town and do a bunch of chores a couple of days ago. And everywhere I went, they had signs in the door that said, we'll be closing early for bad weather. And so that had me a little bit upset. I've never seen that before. Where I live, the only really bad weather we have is hurricanes. And you get about a week of warning before that happens. And everybody you know calls you when it happens. So I don't bother checking the weather. Here's the first real sign anything went wrong. All my stuff is out of my tent again, hanging on line drying. Uh, there are limbs like this all over the ground. And uh, that's not a big deal for me. I can get that picked up in a day. And a lot of them are so small that I'll just run over them with the DR trimmer more. And that'll take care of it. 
Here's another one. Now these small ones, if you're out here in a tent and one of these falls on your, your tent, it's not a big deal. And if you're out here and it falls on your head, it's not a big deal. But when a big one falls, it's called a Widowmaker. I'm going to show you a couple of those. These are what would be called Widowmakers. This didn't come out of my trees during this storm. These are just ones that have been falling out over the years. And I just don't burn them because they look kind of ornamental. But, uh... They call them Widowmakers because they will kill you. You know, these trees out here are about 100 feet tall. And I can't really tell which limbs are going to break out and which ones aren't. I've got a few up there that are obviously dead. But sometimes the dead ones are so hard that you can't break them. And sometimes ones that are alive and healthy will fall out. And you don't know that's going to happen. But I put my tent underneath a big oak tree and I'm thinking now that it's a good time to move it somewhere out in the open. Show you one over here that fell out. You see all that green on there? You wouldn't think that that was a, a sick limb ready to fall. I try to go around and grab all the ones I can that I can reach and just test them and if they break off then you know that they weren't very stable. Some of them are very obviously sick. And so if I can reach them with my little battery-powered chainsaw, I take them out, like this right here. This was a really sick-looking limb. Here's another one. So, you know, I'm aware of the dangers of these limbs. But the ones that are down here, they'll hurt you when they fall, but they aren't going to kill you. It's the ones that are way at the top that'll kill you. And locally, I'm aware of several stories of those limbs coming down. And with, without giving all the gruesome de details, I can promise you they did make widows. So it's dangerous. It's also dangerous when you're out here working. I've, I've been hit pretty hard with some sticks trying to pull vines out of these trees. The vines won't break. The limbs will break. Just in case you're wondering... These are some little bitty limbs that were rotten, ready to break off. And I kept them because they got that resurrection fern all over them. And you know, the, I came out here a while back and I looked up all of my resurrection fern was dead. I was so upset. And uh, I mean, all of it was dead. The next day I came out, it was all alive again. That's where I figured out why they called it resurrection fern. I only had one actual big log that fell during the whole storm. Um, it had stopped raining. I was sitting on the porch, and I heard the sound of a tree falling. A log falling out of a tall tree sounds like a whole tree falling over. You get a crack, and then the whooshing sound of wind, and then the impact on the ground. But anyway, here it is. And there's some of the damage it did to my tent. Actually got two holes in the rain fly big enough to put my fist in. There's that other one, it's up there too. You probably can see it. We'll go inside and take a look. And I don't know exactly how all this went down in here. I wasn't in here. I, I come out here for some pretty hard rain, but I don't come out here during hailstorms. But my sleeping bag was sitting right here, and the flap that uh, you use to tie the sleeping bag into a roll was tore off. I have no idea. You know, I'm thinking there's no way that could have happened. It must have been tore by me pulling all the stuff out of here, but I don't remember hearing or feeling anything like a tear, so maybe that log did. There was a few logs inside of here. Now, up here, I don't know if you can see them, there's little pinholes that are match up with the holes that are in the rain fly. And I think a big, uh, the easy, simple way to cure any roof leaks, and it is going to be simple, uh, is that the, the rain fly, this is the rain fly, and it's separate from the tent. I think for the most part, all I really have to do is take and turn that rain fly around, facing the other direction. That way, the holes in the rain fly will line up with a leak proof roof, and the leaks in the rain fly are the leak proof part of the rain fly will line up with the 
leaky part of the roof. That way, that you know, it's it's double layer, double protection. I don't see any reason to go get my other rain fly and put up there. I just turn this one around, and I will put tape over the holes. Okay, this is what's about to happen with my tent. Just so you know, I'm going to go ahead and pull the rain fly off and put a couple of pieces of tape on the top of the tent over the little teeny tiny pinholes that are under the rain fly. Patch the rain fly with a little bit of duct tape and turn it around and put it back on. After I patch the roof, I'm going to go ahead and put duct tape on them, that big bunch of tears on the side and I'm going to put duct tape inside and out. Then I'm going to get a cheap Harbor Freight tarp and cut out enough of it to put over the top of that patch. Then I'm going to take what's left of the Harbor Freight tarp and cut it to the exact shape of that whole wall of the tent and tape that on there. That way the ultraviolet radiation, the rain, all that will hit that outside patch and have very little effect on the uh, intermediate patch or on the patch that's directly on the tent. And if that outside patch fails, I'll just go ahead and repair that. Hopefully that'll get me to the entire life of the tent after which I'm not worried about it. And I am going to use duct tape. I understand that they have a professional tent patching type of tape that's out there, but that stuff's about $8 a roll, and with the tears I got, it would take four rolls. I'm not going to spend $32 on a tent that I can replace for $100. On top of that, um, that tent's been out there for a year. I don't suspect it's going to make it two more years because tents are simply not designed for long-term living, not a camping tent anyway. There's no reason for me to put a 10-year repair on a tent that can't last another 10 years. Also, that stuff that they sell to, to patch tents is really only good for a 1-inch tear, 2-inch tear, something like that, and obviously the tear I have is a lot bigger than that. So we don't want to fix something with a product that claims it can only fix a two or three inch hole when I'm pretty sure that really good duct tape will fix a two or three inch hole the same way. And uh, duct tape's pretty good for a lot of stuff. I think as long as you keep the weather off of it, it'll, it'll last. And if that outside patch falls off, I'll just tape that back on to cover up the inside patches. Now, if you've got a better idea, let me know. I've already had one subscriber tell me that it would be a good idea to put some kind of glue all over the tent when I stick that tarp on there, and I think that might work. I just have to check in to what kind of glues might be uh, good for that. So if you've got some suggestions, let me know. Uh, but don't, don't suggest that I go down to the camping store and buy that tent repair stuff because that's already been through my head a hundred times, and I just don't see any point in that. I... Uh, have pretty much abandoned my idea of moving the tent where I wanted to move it because that spot is under an oak tree too. I'm actually looking for a, a large opening where I can put the tent and instead of using a tree for camouflage just throw a camouflage tarp over it. Now here's a suggestion that's already been made by one of my subscribers and that is to get the kind of camouflage that's got a lot of holes in it because when you secure that down wind isn't as much of a problem as it is with a solid tarp and that makes sense but if you've got a better suggestion let me know well that's the end of this episode of tent living i hope you enjoyed it and as always if you don't want to survive don't listen to me